Hello everyone. So in the last video, I've explained the peptic ulcer disease, and um, we didn't we didn't dive into the perforation of a peptic ulcer. So if we have if this is a stomach in there, so peptic ulcer, let's say, so peptic ulcer means it's gastric, but it can happen in the duodenum as well. If you remember the anatomy that we talked about before, so you have behind the first part of the duodenum, you have the gastroduodenal artery, which goes all the way down, like that. Okay, so if you have um, a peptic ulcer on the posterior wall of the stomach, it can start perforation and start eroding through the blood vessel and can go significant hemorrhage or upper GI bleeding. That's why it's quite important to know the risks and benefits, the risks and, uh, and causes of the um, peptic ulcer disease or perforated peptic ulcer and also how to diagnose it. Obviously, if a patient had perforated peptic ulcer, they can come with an upper GI bleed, and they can come with intra-abdominal bleed as well, and peritonitic abdomen, sudden and severe abdominal pain, uh, um, and they would probably need to be taken to theater immediately. So, the scenario here says that you have a 44-year-old year old, year old male patient coming with abdominal pain, and the abdomen is peritonitic in examination, and there's background history of osteo arthritis and taken insects. So this this clue is very important. So if a patient coming with peritonitic abdomen, it could be anything generally, but mostly it's gonna be perforated peptic ulcer if the patient is taking insects. This X-ray will even further confirm. So if you look at this X-ray, this is a diaphragm and you have some air bubble under the diaphragm. So this is air under the diaphragm, which confirm a perforated viscous. So what are the causes of perforation? So, or the risk factors of perforation, NSAIDs will be on the top of the list because it's very irritant to the mucosa of the stomach and will cause atrophic gastritis. And also H. pylori is another thing, steroids and previous peptic ulcer and malignancy. So these are the main risk factors. But how does it, does it work? What is the protective mechanism that we have in place? So this, this section is basically you're looking into the stomach wall. So you have here, this is the epithelial layer, or the mucosa layer, sorry. And this is the epithelial layer, and this is the sub-epithelial layer. So this, obviously, the mucosa layer, and this is where the blood supply comes. So the protective mechanism, so we have sort of the very thick and firmly adherent mucosa. So the mucosa here is firmly adherent to the cells. And that will make the diffusion of the nutrients down there more uh, higher. All right, that's one. The other thing is you have part of a loosely adherent mucosa, which has large amount of mucin with a gradient of pH, meaning you have continuous production of HDU3, and that will protect the mucosa. Again, it's very high pH, oh, sorry, very low pH in the gastric mucosa of and the gastric, and the um, stomach cavity of pH 1 to 2, all right? So you have a gradient of pH 1 to 2 inside the cavity, and then mucine with a little bit higher pH of up to 7.4. And you have the epithelial cells, as you can see in here. These epithelial cells has blood supply, which is filled with nutrients that will keep it surviving and in high turnover, or high repair. So if one of them is injured, can be repaired very easily due to the rich blood supply of the stomach. There is a certain uh, compound that can easily cause vasodilatation and increase the amount of these nutrients, which is the prostaglandin, all right? The prostaglandin. Okay, so when you give your patient insights, let's see what will happen. Okay. So when you give your patient NSAIDs, first of all, that's even more acidic, so increasing the pH and very irritant to this mucosa. So number one, irritation to the mucosa. Two is decreasing the repair. And three, it decreases the production of prostaglandin, like we explained earlier, and this will consequently decrease the blood flow as well. So decrease in production of prostaglandin synthesis and decrease the blood flow. And that will decrease the blood 
flow to the wall and will further decrease the repair as well. So these are the causes. So interfere with the mucosal barrier is very irritant to the mucosa, decrease the repair, and also uh, the reduction of blood flow and the reduction of prostaglandin production. The management options for a perforated peptic ulcer, you can inject adrenaline, you can put an omental patch, and you can do a peritoneal toilet if the patient had perforation, and then you can do a biopsy just to rule out malignancy. What is the mechanism of action of prostag uh, PPIs? So PPIs is um, usually there is something called uh, uh, the way we produce HCL, which will decrease the pH of our mucosa. You have the parietal cells, and there is something called H hydrogen potassium ATPase, and this is under continuous production of hydrogen. Okay, under continuous production of hydrogen into the cavity of the stomach, all right? So the, the, the way uh, PPIs work, proton bomb inhibitors, is they block the hydrogen, potassium, AT base on the parietal cells. So the HCL, despite it, it's causing an ulcer, obviously, but it's a quite important compound because it has an antimicrobial effect and usually activate pepsinogen into pepsin and activate cholecystokinin as well and increase the calcium absorption. There are three phases for uh, gastric acid production, and it's the cephalic phase. This is when you smell or taste some food. There is some impulse of that going through the vagus to stimulate the stomach to release HCL. Gastric phase, 60% of the production, and this happened due to stomach distension, or, or low hydrogen as well. And then finally, intestinal phase, and that's 10% of acid production and high acidity distension and hypertonic solution in the duodenum and have a gastric acid production. So these are the phases. So you have cephalic phase uh, via the vagus nerve, and that is 30% of the production. You have also a gastric phase, and that's 60% of the production. Duodenal phase, and this is 10% of the production. The final thing is, obviously, the patient had a perforation. This is considered as a life-threatening operation, and the patient will need to immediately go to uh, surgery. Or actually, it's an urgent operation, and the patient will need to go urgently, which means with an hour. So the NEC pod, or the NC pod, is basically try to um, classify the uh, different operations into immediate operations, and urgent, and expedited, and elective operation. So immediate, it's a life or limb saving, should happen immediately, within minutes, and the next available appointment, whether during the night or day. But urgent, it can happen within hours or within what, uh, from the decision, and usually happen in the daytime or out of our emergency list as well. Expedited, that means stable patient, but requiring early intervention, usually should happen in days. An example to that, if, uh, let's say, a patient had uh, on the waiting list of uh, cholecystectomy, and the waiting list is for two months, and came to you with acute pancreatitis. Now, you probably will need, you will need to take the patient and do the um, cholecystectomy. Elective, you can wait, and all conditions uh, that are not classified, immediate and urgent or expedited, can be elective. Thank you very much.